The only common thread of the investments, the boards I sit on, the only common thread, there's a million variables of what makes somebody win. Sometimes the CEO, she or he is just too talented and they fucking will it to success. Other times there's some random outside factors, people get caught at times, there's things. But the only common thread that I see in the world of making something win is how attention is the number one asset. I'm just extremely excited to be here because I've been very fortunate in my career to be able to speak on a lot of stages, but as you can imagine, some stages are just a little more authentic to you than others. Given how my career has played out, the founders, the alcohol business, marketing, like innovation, early investor in Uber, like there's just so many things. When I think about this incredible company, you know, when I go and speak at like the National Dairy Association, it's, a, it's not, as much on the head of what this is. And for me, there's just an enormous amount of admiration I have for this org, so thank you so much for having me. And more importantly, what I get excited about is, as someone who has been an entrepreneur his whole life and who's been an investor, especially in a lot of companies that look the profile of this company, you're always curious which organizations have that stomach to go through the different chapters. Right, as again, Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and other companies that I invested in early on, those are the ones that I can speak to and it's like, cool, there's plenty of companies that had incredible starts that I was involved in that you don't know. Like, I don't think a lot of people here know what the fuck Yobongo is, right? And I think about that crossroads and I think it's an interesting time in general and I also think that 2024, is gonna be a really fun business year because I think we're settled into a true post-COVID world. And, and I kind of like when it's real. I think when there's too much money in the system, like the VC decade of the past, or when it's like too, you know, obviously when we print money and give it to everybody, people are just buying dumb shit, we just lived through that. I just feel like we're in this really cool spot where it's real, and I think real companies will emerge during real times. And so for me, I was pretty excited to say yes to this because I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a cool one to watch in five or seven years because I have some sneaky intuition of how this movie plays out. So I just want to thank all of you for allowing me to be here. Look, uh, on the flight down here, I posted an, an Instagram post and in the copy, I'm like, 8% of the year is already gone, which like really shook me because as you know, the world has gotten soft and nobody really worked until the Tuesday after Martin Luther King this year. And so it took about two weeks for this year to even get started. And so like the fact that 8% of the year is already done has me like kind of a little shook and speaks to like the urgency and like the focus I'm trying to think about. And I'm, I'm sure for all of you, you're thinking that through. It's, it's fun that you brought everyone together. I think there's a lot of value in that. I'm thinking a lot about the serendipity and things of that nature. Also what's interesting for me is as someone who grew up from 14 to 34 years old, working retail, you know, Monday through Saturday, uh, from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. in a liquor store my whole life, and then over the last 15 years have built a marketing corporation of 2,000 people. It's also like really fun to be in an audience that's mixed with remarkable corporate people, but then also people in the trenches. And as somebody who's lived 20 years in both categories, if I just may, for two seconds, and this is with incredible love for everyone that's in corporate, but can we take one second and clap it the fuck up for the people that are actually in the field of the crowd. Like maybe a little louder because they're actually, you know. Oh. <laughs> and again, you know what? It was funny. It was funny because I was thinking about it. I was like, fuck, this company also represents how I've lived my last 40 years. And I was like, I was like, all right, I want to say this because I really feel it. I wonder how it's gonna land because I want to make sure all the corporate people know I'm not razzing, but I, was, I, I actually said to myself, I helicoptered over from New York real quick this morning to do this. In my mind, I was like, it'll be interesting. Um, how that reaction goes will be a really interesting indication to me of where the company is, and so kudos to y'all. I appreciate the fact that everybody in corporate understands the difference of people that are actually in the trenches every day, that reaction doubled down my confidence in where GoPuff's going, so thank you for that. So really, that, it's real talk. It's real talk. 
Because when it snows, you can't just be like, oh, I'm gonna zoom. <laughs> you have to go in, it's real shit. Anyway. <laughs> I think that the thing that I'm most thinking about of like, what's everyone in here thinking about? Like, how are they thinking about this year? I think perspective is a big focus of mine. I think that how one sees life is how it is, right? I've been very like weirded out by this whole half glass full, half glass empty thing. And th- th- that really struck me too as I thought about this talk. I'm like, just wonder how people are thinking about shit at GoPuff, right? Because for me, again, just to put it into, actually, how many people here know very little about me or have no idea who the fuck I am? Just raise your hands real loud. All right, that fucking hurts. <laughs> Let me actually, I I thought that might be the case, so let me give you three seconds on this to set up what I was about to say. So real quick for everyone who just raised their hands, I was born in the Soviet Union, I immigrated to the US, we lived in Queens in a studio apartment with eight family members. It was ghetto fucking, you know, immigrant shit. Like, by the time I was eight, I realized my parents aren't buying me toys or video games, so I was fucking straight. Lemonade stands. Like when I was seven, because we moved to Edison, New Jersey, when I was seven, I literally, tricked or manipulated or convinced or motivated my six best friends to stand behind lemonade stands all day long. And this group is way too young, but for the couple of you that are in your 40s or above, I don't know if you remember back in the 80s, we had something called big wheels. They were like, like that, you remember that shit? I used to ride my big wheels at like 5 p.m. during the summer. At the end of the day, I would ride my big wheels to the six lemonade stand locations that I created and picked up my money like I was fucking Tony Soprano. (laughs) And then I went into baseball cards. It was making like $2,000 a weekend selling baseball cards in seventh and eighth grade in 1985. Like real talk, when you have $10,000 in cash under your bed and you're 11 and you're not selling weed, you're a fucking entrepreneur. And then, thank you. (laughs) Then my dad ruined my life. I was making all this money, and then I turned 14. Oldest son, born in the old country. My dad went from a stock boy making two bucks an hour in a liquor store to owning a small store in Springfield, New Jersey. And so Merchant's son, like I had to go work there. And I went from making $1,000, $2,000 a weekend selling baseball cards in the malls in New Jersey being cool and fucking living to making two bucks an hour, working 14 hours a day in my dad's liquor store. And I mean every day. I don't, know many ha- I don't know how many of you have a Soviet father, but it was like no bullshit. It was 14 hours a day, seven hours in the basement bagging ice for the cooler and then coming up and stocking shelves. And that like became the foundation of my career. Then I realized people collected wine and then in 1996, I launched one of the first e-commerce wine businesses in America called Wine Library. Blew up my dad's business and that kind of is how my career took off. My dad really didn't, I, Again, how many people here are immigrants, like their parents were born in, outside the US, or you have? Raise your hands. So you guys know, like, my dad didn't pay me shit, even though I worked from 22 to 34 in that liquor store. I built that business from a three to a $75 million business, and I never got paid more than eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year, even though I did all that. And so I had to go do my own thing. But the foundation of that, real brick and mortar retail e-commerce grind, and then, over the last 14 years, I became an early investor on Facebook, Twitter, Uber, that changed obviously a lot for me, but I built a company called VaynerMedia, which is one of the largest marketing companies in the world, 2,000 employees globally. What, what, what that does, back to why I said I feel so connected to y'all, is I've just really lived both sides of the equation, especially, can I hear some noise for the BevMo folks in here? Yeah. Some good beat. So I have a crazy good relationship with y'all, though complicated, meaning I really love you because I grew up like you, but I also grew up in an era where BevMo was such this iconic thing in California, and when I was like 15, I used to like literally play like Sega Genesis, I'm like, yo, one day I'm gonna put BevMo out of fucking business. <laughs> so it's nice to be with all of you. Um, You know, of course then for all that noise, like for BevMo, you can't imagine like how much I think about what is the marketing gonna be like? How do we get people in store? What are the trends? You know, it's crazy to watch how people have different trends in drinking alcohol. For example, if you know anything about wine, how many people here have had rosé wine? Make some noise. 
I worked in my dad's liquor store from 1990. Pretty much every, when I was a kid in school, every weekend and summer vacation, and then the day I graduated, literally I drove from Boston, and in the middle of the day, I got there at 3.30 on that day, and literally worked until seven. Like, it was no time down. So basically from 1990 to 2015, I've worked in a liquor store my whole life. When I tell you, we would sell from 1990 to 2005, we would sell four cases of rosé a year. A year. Now we sell 100 cases of rosé a week in the winter, not even in the summer, as you all know. That consumer shift is the most interesting. I grew up hearing war stories that people used to drink whiskey and bourbon because in my era, nobody did. It was all vodka and then became tequila, right? And people, like the old liquor salesman would be like, no, no, like 25-year-old women used to drink brown goods. I'm like, you're fucking crazy, is that serious? And then obviously over the last 10 years, that has come back. Consumer trends are incredibly interesting. It's one of the most fascinating things and I think it plays out in the things you sell, both on the liquor side and on the snack side. I think it's gonna be really interesting because what's amazing about your organization from my perspective is you're close to the customer. You have the data, you get to see it. That's gonna end up playing out to be a very big deal and whoever's closest to the customer wins. There is nothing else. Like to me, all of my success in my career has been customer, my employees, and then me. And I give my dad a lot of credit for always caring about the store more than his children. I've gone to therapy for it, but (laughs) I respect the shit out of it because I understand it. And I think, again, that's gonna be an interesting ride to watch. Look, I think the biggest things that I'm thinking through is one, one thing that I asked Dan, actually, in the green room, like, talk to me about the, you know, like, the stock options, things like that, it's like owners. And I'm like, that's super interesting because I think that gets it really motivating really fast, right? Like, back to like people in the trenches real quick. I'm not sh- like, why don't I just wanna make, make sure that people understand like the upside of that game. I think when things are on paper, like I, it's been, uh, I'll tell you the story that most hit me when I understood the stock option play. I was like, Facebook was obviously my biggest win in my career, right? And last night, ironically, going through social, I got home later around midnight and I saw that the stock market had a big day. I, I tend to look at my portfolio like, one, like, I don't know, once every three months. But I just happened to see like, oh, Dow Jones went off. I'm like, oh, let me look. And I saw that Facebook was at $400 a share. And immediately I got like the worst pit in my stomach, not for me, from the day I invested in Facebook four years before its IPO to this morning, I've never sold a share because I believed in the founder. Right, obviously I'm very aware of what people think about Zucks and the way the media has played it out, but as the guy driving it, I always told my whole family that the day he's out is the day I share, sell, but until he's out, I hold forever. The reason I'm bringing it up is what I'm most fascinated about 2024, what I'm most fascinated about every employee in here at this moment in the history of GoPuff's company as a complete outside observer who watches the game is I'm fascinated by people's lack of patience. The reason I bring up this Facebook story to you this morning is because I was early at Facebook, because I made a video in 2007, six, that said Facebook should be worried about this new app called Twitter. And it went viral inside of Facebook and I got called to go give a speech. Check this out. The entire company of Facebook at the time when I gave my talk of why Twitter was gonna be a thing was half the size of this audience right now. It was early. I didn't even know Zucks was in the audience, back to how like weird and different he is. He was in the way back and I did my spiel. And in 2006 I said, social media is gonna win because it's human behavior. That's it. Like the reason everybody wears the hat and the clothes they wear is to communicate to others. The reason we buy fancy cars is to communicate to others. Almost everything we do as humans is to communicate to others. Obviously with our mouths and the way we roll, but with subtle shit that you don't even realize. Every photo you ever posted on social is subconsciously something you're trying to say. Position yourself. Front at worst, or communicate your truth at best. And so that's how it is, and so I understood that. Anyway, that struck a chord. We hit it off, we had dinner, 
and I invested in Facebook very quickly after that, and I mean all of my savings. I bet the farm. The part about patience that I wanna talk about in 2024 is about what happened next. Three years later, it went public. Over those three years before it went public, I got to know a bunch of the top 100 execs. When the stock came out, some of you might remember this because you were youngsters, or you know, it was a big moment. It opened at about $40 a share, 42. It went down to 19 pretty quickly. Most of the friends that I made in those three years that were top 300, 400, first 500 employees of Facebook sold somewhere between 25 and 19. They made a lot of money. The ones I knew were there super early and very senior. They made a lot, like, like nope. This story is not to cry for those motherfuckers. <laughs> what's interesting is seeing them over the last 10 years. What's interesting for me is someone who got in for much less, much later. The fact that I'm gonna end up making more money on Facebook than a lot of those people fucks with me. And it was just one big game of lack of patience. And so I think what I'm most focused about in 2024 personally is thinking about that. How much of my decision making is based on tomorrow and how much is it for a year from now? You know what I love about retail? What I love about retail is the signature story that is still told in my dad's liquor store even though I haven't been there day to day for a decade is a story of December 18th in our store when I was the most important salesman on the floor and it was snowing and we had just done the internet thing for the last four or five years and we got a phone call from a woman in Bergen County, New Jersey who was ye not yelling at us, she was like, oh. when I got on the phone she sounded like fucking Yoda, she was like a thousand. <laughs> but she was complaining that it was important for her to get, and this is a good one, especially for the Bevmo crowd, her Behringer White Zinfandel. <laughs> Rosé used to be sweet for all of you that don't know, in America. Her Behringer White Zinfandel had not been delivered and it was a whole to-do and her son called and says, you don't understand the, the, the FedEx that got delivered. Anyway, punchline is this. It, in one of our busiest days of the year, off of me learning about this while I was on the floor from the internet department, I ran downstairs to the warehouse, grabbed a 15-pack of Behringer White Zinfandel threw it into my car and drove to Bergen County and delivered it personally and drove back and was off the floor for about two or three hours. During that time, many top dog customers came in only willing to work with me, ready to spend five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on their collection and left. When I got back, the core crew was like, what the fuck? What I knew then, and I did many things like this, this is the one I just get to tell on stage. What I knew then was, Actions have to set the tone for a culture. What I knew was I was gonna take an L in the short term on that day. But I felt that it would be something that everybody in the crew, especially because I knew I was looking to build long term and the 20 people that were around me, I was hoping and played out, would be there for 10, 15 years. I needed something to point to for them to understand what our DNA was both on the corporate side and in the trenches here, I think we think too short term. The reason I tell that story is with the hope that one person decides, like, that makes sense. When I face something tomorrow, do I think about it from the short term reality of it, or do I think about it as, is this an opportunity to set the tone for what we're trying to do? I think that kind of mentality of patience and brand building and culture building is everything. You know, to me, uh, for example, this event. With this event, when, when I was asked to do it back in the winter, I was so pumped that you were all gonna be together. I remember just thinking like, yes, that's exactly right. And I'm a businessman, and I pay attention. So I'm aware of what's macro going on with GoPuff and they're trying to be strategic about what they spend their money on and not. And I'm like, good for them to understand this. Like for example, what he just did was fucking phenomenal. I hope I drop three or four things that make you think about something and maybe do something. This will be a good day of like content, I'm sure. 
But everything that happens on this stage today is bullshit compared to if you take advantage of all the downtime, all those minutes in between lunch break, I don't know what the fuck, you, you do lunch? Your lunch. I don't eat lunch, I think it's a complete fucking waste of time. <laughs> Retail, that's what it fucking teaches you. <laughs> so when you're at lunch today, <laughs> if you can do me one favor, what will normally happen in this environment is you're gonna sit with your homies, the people you're probably sitting with right now. The only thing that matters about shit like this is that the people in here who have the ability because they have enough extrovert, enough confidence, enough self-esteem, please challenge yourself to go and say what's up to somebody you don't recognize. Go sit with somebody you don't know. That interconnected tissue is everything. That is the only way corporations, teams, companies win. So I highly ask the people in here who have it in them to go and do that, to set the tone during the down periods of this event because that is disproportionately why you should be here. Can I get a little noise for the people that feel they can do that? <laughs> Look, I think, I think that there's so much opportunity in front, but I wanna talk about something else that's a little bit on what I've been talking about, and I'm gonna frame it up for all of you as another thing to contemplate. And again, I'll be honest with you, when I do these kind of talks, I'm, little, I'm more about the humans than I am about the logo. Like, I like the GoPuff guys, I like Dan a lot. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan from afar of the business, but what I'm about to talk about, I think is essential for all of you, for your career within, or after, when you're not here, or whatever plays out for all of you. What I've been talking about for the last five to seven minutes, and what I'd like to frame up for all of you as one man's point of view of something that has clearly worked for everybody at all levels in the business world over the last 30 years that I've observed, is scaling the unscalable. So I wanna spend a few minutes on this concept and just put this in your mind, scaling the unscalable. Me driving that Behringer White Zinfandel for two hours for something that was like $30 for a case was scaling the unscalable. The thing that I really wanna to talk to some of the field leaders, especially in the stores or even corporate, is I can't get over this mind that if you're really as customer-centric as you like to say you are to the world, and I see how you try to position yourself, I'd like to challenge everyone here to do more scaling of the unscalable for customers. So for example, I'm about to tell you a story that is also iconic to me that I think GoPuff can scale 10,000 times better than I did 15 years ago. And I think this is for corporate and then I've got one for the field. So for corporate, so Twitter came out. I was fascinated by it. I was like, the world's changing, the internet's changing. And I was really focused on lifetime value and retention. I'm sure for the people in analytics in this company, when you look at all the people that have bought from GoPuff or BevMo, but haven't bought from you in six months or 12 months, you just look at it like, fuck, it's all right there. The, re the lapsed user is one of the most interesting things in business. So I was obsessed with that. I was like, we have the best, pr you know, we were really rolling at Wine Library. Like, we have the best prices, we have the best selection. I felt real confident, I was like, why isn't everybody buying everything from us? <laughs> like I wanted it. And so I started thinking about, okay, we're doing all this internet shit right, but we're not doing like the heavy touch. You know, the shit that fucking locks it in. So I said to the team, I had this idea, boarding a plane to Napa, ironically, I had the idea, I called my best friend Brandon who runs the store, I said, why don't you do something? I want every order that comes on winelibrary.com, I want you to Google the person's name and see if you can find them. Obviously some people have John Smith, that'll be hard. Luckily some people have Gary Vaynerchuk and there's only one of them and you can find them. If you find someone who's, you really know who the fuck it is, it's that person, let me know. They found someone. I said, now I want you to go and find them on Twitter. Can you find, and this was Twitter early. So like most people weren't on. So I knew it would take a little bit. About a week or two later I get a call. We got some dude. I'm like amazing. So 
he, they go, we got this dude, he, he, bad news, this is gonna really make the BevMo people laugh. Bad news, though, we found him, but he bought a case of Santa Margarita Pinot Grigio. <laughs> the shittiest, most overpriced wine of all time. Real talk, super overrated. Kudos to them. It's one of the few wine brands that have built an actual brand so people are buying what is really $4 Pinot Grigio for 25 bucks. Thank you. I go, that's cool. I go, here's what I want you, so I go, tell me, so I'm on the phone with Brandon, he goes, I found his Twitter. I go, what's he tweeting? This is where the story gets interesting. Every tweet out of this dude's mouth is, Jay Cutler, I love you. <laughs> so this dude lives in Chicago and he's a huge Bears fan. And he's tweeting, like now we all tweet along with sports all the time, but this was early shit. And it's like, Jay Cutler, why'd you throw that pass? Jay Cutler, don't do that. Great job, Jay. It's fucking Jay Cutler. <laughs> For the majority of you who don't know, I'll just say it one more time, Jay Cutler was the quarterback of the Chicago Bears at the time. I'm like, okay. I go, Brandon, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to eBay and I want you to buy a Jay Cutler jersey signed in a frame and send it to him with a note that says thank you for shopping at Wine Library. Brandon's like, bro, that's like 350 bucks. We made like $8.09 in the whole case <laughs> of Santa Margarita. I go, I know, I know. I go, trust me, I just want to do this. So I'm thinking we're going to send this fucking Jay Cutler fanatic a jersey. He's going to fucking be blown away and then I'll show Brandon and the team just like my Behringer story and like, look, he spent all his money with us over the next two years. Let's do this. I had a whole master plan. I'm so pumped. I'm like, I'm a fucking, I'm a fucking genius. I'm like, yes. And then real life hits. This, we send this dude this thing. We don't hear a fucking peep. <laughs> Nothing. Now it's a month. It's two. Now I'm not like, you know, when you're like picking a scab. Like now I'm like just addicted to this fucking. Sp- I got a million things going on. All I give a fuck about is some random dentist in fucking Chicago. <laughs> who I sent the Jay Cutler jersey to that bought fucking Pinot Grigio from the fucking most overpriced producer in the world and hasn't said thank you. <laughs> so I'm dead like for those months. I'm like really annoyed about it. We do some other little things, but this one really stuck to me because it was so egregious, right? Like it was so big for what he bought. And then one of the most interesting things happened. I get a phone call from Brandon. Again, Brandon is currently, right now, in Wine Library in Springfield, New Jersey, not too far from here. Like, I met him on the first day of high school. So my best friend, but also runs my family business. He calls me, he's like, you're never gonna believe this. And just by the way he said it, you know when you know somebody for 15 years and you're, like I knew it was that. I was like, the fucking Jay Cutler guy replied? He goes, no. (laughs) I go, this motherfucker. He goes, just stick with me. He goes, let me read this. I'm like, go ahead. So read some name, Plano, Texas, and he rattles off like a $7,000 red burgundy order, right? So just really high-end, single vineyard stuff, like just really esoteric, small producer, red burgundies, seven Gs. I'm like, okay, that's a good order, but I'm like, but what, what's the punch? Because I knew he wouldn't just call me for that. I'm like, yo, what? He goes, he goes, no, no, he's like, wait for it. He goes, da 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 he goes, now let me read you what's in the note. So that's when I knew it would get good. I'm like, what? He goes, hey, um, first of all, you have an amazing burgundy selection. Can I speak to somebody? I'm looking for some other stuff. Second, I live in Texas. It's hot as shit. Can you please hold it for a while? He goes, P.S. My best friend lives in Chicago and you sent him a Jay Cutler jersey and that's how I found out about your store. P.S.S. I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. (laughs) That happened fucking 15 years ago. I think about it all the time. And I think when I was, you know, thinking about this talk, I was like, what's the move that they can actually do? Like coming and giving a talk, you only got a limited amount of time And like you could talk about mindset and perspective and I'm touching on different shit as you can tell. But I was like, what's the action that this company can actually do that can reinforce so they can taste it of what I'm actually talking about? When I analyze from afar the virtual and physical combo of GoPuff and BevMo, 
and especially really knowing the BevMo business and understanding what's happening in the California market, and obviously you're in other markets as well, liquor bar, these things. I really do believe, both for yourselves and for your customers, that 2024 is an incredible opportunity to scale the unscalable. There's a lot of ways to spend marketing dollars. You can run Facebook ads and Google ads and in-app. There's other ways to spend money, things that create depth, like buying a Jay Cutler jersey and sending it to someone. You are sitting on, on both companies, unlimited data, unlimited. All of the magic sits there. We have just gotten into a world where everything is digital and virtual and scalable and AI is coming and it's all this and all that's happening is we're getting further away from a business era that our grandparents lived in. I actually believe the way our grandparents did business is actually the real opportunity of the next decade. It is the people that understand whoever brings the most humanity wins. I believe that that will matter for the way you frame up how much you care about customers. I actually believe there's a more important story in here, which is what if you did that to each other? Back to what I asked for for you to consider at lunch, what if you actually went deeper with each other? What if you actually cared, like for real? What ends up happening is, it's like sports. How many people here fuck with sports? Make some noise. Actually, this is perfect. I'm so pumped right now, it just hit me. My number one example for what I'm about to say happened in Philadelphia. I don't remember the year, I think it was 2002, three, four, but there was a year that the Eagles, anybody an Eagles fan here? Good. So you're gonna remember that I see clips. Remember that super team you guys built like 15 years ago? It was supposed to be the greatest fucking team of all time. You got the cornerback from the Raiders. It was gonna like dominate. I was like, fuck, this is boring. They're gonna go 16 and 0 and win the Super Bowl. I don't like the NFL being like this. It's like baseball, this is bullshit. I was, and then you guys went like eight and eight and missed the playoffs and sucked shit. <laughs> that story is how I look. I've made a lot of money investing and I've lost a lot of money investing. And I've built two very successful companies with my hands, and then I've also started Resi, the restaurant app, inside of VaynerMedia, and I had a direct-to-consumer wine brand called Empathy that I sold to Constellation. So I've had wins, and I've had plenty of losses. The only common thread of the investments, the boards I sit on, the only common thread, there's a million variables of what makes somebody win. Sometimes the CEO, she or he is just too talented and they fucking will it to success. Other times there's some random outside factors, people get caught at times, there's things. But the only common thread that I see in the world of making something win is how much the locker room likes each other. That Eagles team was uncomfortably talented. Every dude in that locker room was out for themselves and could give a shit about their teammate. That's why they lost so much. When I think about the crossroads of the business world we live in today in the consumer lens, when I think about what your competitive landscape will look like, both on BevMo and GoPuff in the next decade, the only thing that is clear to me, besides the fact from afar I'm getting to know them, I think your founders are really strong. Besides that, what is very obvious to me is the outcome of your financial winnings here, your enjoyment here, and what it sets you up for. Because the best part is, with all respect to the founders and everybody else, the best part of winning at GoPuff during this era is what it sets you up for in seven years if you win at a company like this during this era. That's real talk. That's for your grandchildren. And so there is so much uncomfortable upside in this room, but I genuinely believe regardless of how talented the top seven, 10, 15 people are in this company, the most obvious variable of how well that all plays out is how well the thousand people in this room get along. I really believe that. Not on some grandma, sappy, foo-foo, woo-woo shit. On some, I only care about winning. I love business. I've done it my whole life. And all I do is observe and it is the only common thread I've seen. And so I ask you, as I bounce off this stage, to consider that framework because I think the upside's there for you 
And if you can find a way to be the bigger person, if you can find a way to scale the unscalable, first for each other and then for your customers, I think you win. I'd like to see you win. Because I'm a Jets fan and I don't get to win a lot. (laughs) And so I like to see others win. Um, That's actually not true. I want to confess something because I just need to get this off my chest. This feels like a good medium. There was obviously some big football games this Sunday. For the people that do know, actually how many people here do know about me and consume some of my content? Can you clap it up? Thank you. So for those people in this audience, you're aware I'm a pretty optimistic fucking positive dude. But there's one version of me that isn't. Football Gary. (laughs) And Football Gary is why I understand why people are on tilt around politics and around other shit. Because it's the only place where I don't have my emotions in check and I'm not proud of who I am. (laughs) And I just want to get this out because it's important to get shit out. I just want to confess something. This Sunday, when the Lions were dominating the 49ers, I thought going into the game that I was rooting for the Lions, especially because my brother and I have a sports agency and we rep five Detroit Lions, including Aiden Hutchinson. So naturally I thought, but Sports Gary kicked in at halftime. And I realized one of the things I most believe in in the world that I ask all of you to pay attention There's a lot of sayings in life. The most real one is misery loves company. A lot of people in this room are fucked up right now because they're spending too much time watching the news or their social media feeds, watching people that are trying to drag you down into their unhappiness by selling you fear. Misery loves company. In real life, I limit misery. I limit my relatives and friends who are not happy, who are trying to drag me down. I'm there for them, but I limit it. In football, Gary, I don't. I'm super mad, and I hate everybody. Who's a Patriots fan? Yeah, I fucking hate you so much, bro. Like, like, anyway, I don't understand why we don't love each other. We're all just one team. But I do understand, because I hate that dude. I liked him, it's funny how life works. I liked him 15 minutes ago, because I saw the day the Wu-Tang hoodie on, I'm like, yo, I fuck with that dude. But then he said he was a Patriots fan. Anyway, I just want to get this off my chest, I have to confess, it is scary to me how much I wanted the Lions to lose, because I didn't want another shitty franchise to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Anyway, to end my speech, 2024, don't be football Gary. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you, my dude. Thank you so much, Sopop. Have a great year. Bevmo, I love you.